Hey, and welcome to this architectural painting demo. Um, so I've already done a little bit of work on architecture before. Just to review, there's, uh, you know, you want to work with large planes. Every time you change the plane direction, you want to change the value. You also have the opportunity to change um, the value as a transitional gradient across any plane. That helps create a palpable sense of light. Um, the new concept that we're going to stack this time is called ambient lighting. And that's basically light that bounces off the sky and um, illuminates shadows within an image. Um, we've already added reflected light into that. We've done uh, concepts like underpainting and underdrawing. And we're actually going to do a sort of combination of that to begin. What I have done is I've mixed a middle value blue with just a little bit of light, um, uh, light color in one of three piles. So I've kind of got a transition within the middle values of blue to kind of create the sky. And the palette that we're going to be using today is just is very simple. It's ultramarine blue, yellow ochre, white, black, and just the smallest dab of cadmium red light or cadmium red pale. Um, just because the, the light color has just a tinge of orange when it hits this building that we're going to paint. And so the first thing um, that we're going to do here is just literally cover the cover the canvas or the paper. So I've upped the scale for this. Most of the demos have been on smaller paper for this course. Um, but we're going up to 9 by 12 now because I think with architecture, if you want to get details and you want to get a sense of scale, you need a bit bigger of a canvas. It's a bit difficult unless you're going to get there, get there with tiny brushes to paint on a, a tiny, tiny scale, um, especially this kind of like corporate building. If you're just painting like the front of a house or... Uh, or something kind of more residential, it might be easier. Um, also, inevitably, with architecture, there's going to be elements of landscape, you know, ground, shrubbery, things like that. Um, to make it easier, what we're going to also do is l put the horizon line very low at about 20% of the way up the canvas um, from the bottom. If you put the horizon line very like very high, you need really good perspective skills. If you put it down low, it mo mostly focuses on shapes. Um, and that's something to keep in mind whether you do landscape or architectural stuff. Um, things get complicated uh, the higher up you place your horizon. You know, fortunately, this building is, is a giant corporate building, so, you know, having the whole thing in the frame automatically puts the horizon low because you wind up looking up. Um, if you want a blended sort of gradient with acrylic, you have to move quickly. Uh, that's a that's a major concern. You need medium. I use uh, the Liquitex, Liquitex Ultra Matte. I like it a lot. It gets a very flat finish. The photographs pretty well. Um, and the colors tend to mesh together very well um, also the having the underpainting down quickly is also really psychologically good because the canvas is covered and you've done uh, like half the work basically if you know what you're gonna paint and the canvas is covered you have a painting you know um, and from here on it gives you something uh, to base uh, color judgments and value judgments off of. Um, and spending some time getting the underpainting color mixed right, I think is very important because if you get it right, if you get it at the right value, if you get it at the right saturation, if the color's right, it makes everything easier as you go along. Um, what we're going to do once this is done is just let it dry. And obviously, I'm gonna, the video is going to do a little time jump to when it's dry. Um, and we're going to mix methods here. So potentially even I wouldn't even have to cover this area because I know that it's going to get covered with other colors. But just for my sake of sanity, I, I'm going to cover it all the way. Um, this also has the effect of sort of priming the canvas, so I need less paint on subsequent layers. Okay, 
Now, we're mixing two methods here. So we've done an underpainting, and now we're going to get uh, out a pencil. I'm using an HB. You can use whatever. Um, and very lightly sketch in some of the larger shapes. And so we're mixing uh, an underpainting color and underdrawing. And that's kind of a good way to prepare, especially if you have decent drawing skills, um, because this takes a lot of the the pressure off. You're not having to find the paint or the find the shapes with paint only. Um, that can be difficult sometimes, especially if this is one of your first paintings um, and you're you're kind of new to this stuff. Other times, other people just like to go and <laughs> work very quickly. The other thing that I think about too is simplifying shapes. So I'm laying in this layer of trees here with basically just loose triangles um, to block in those shapes. I'm not drawing every little architectural shape. I drew in the main corner um, because I can know where the rest of the corners are based off the little V notch at the top of this building. Um, the first thing that I'm going to do is actually uh, counterintuitively, I'm going to paint the blue that is uh, has a gradient in the reflection of the windows first. So my building isn't, I'm not going in with any of the concrete color. I'm actually going in with the ambient color of the sky. So um, if I wanted a more photo real, photo accurate version of this, I would use cerulean blue in the palette and probably mix it in with some of the ultramarine and that would get a better sky color. But just to keep things simple, I think ultramarine's fine. And um, if you didn't have ultramarine and all you had was cerulean or cobalt or something, that would all work. Um, so what I've noticed in the reference photo that I took this morning actually is that I have kind of a uh, light to dark uh, top right to bottom left transition going on in this front facing plane and that's reflecting the, the, the sky that's actually behind me in the photograph. So what I can do as a strategy is paint this transition in, use some of the underpainting to finish the transition. Um, I don't actually have to do the whole transition. I know I'm going to get another building and some dark shapes from the trees in the reflection as well. Um, and then after I finish that, I let that dry and then I can paint the grid of the concrete on top. And that's going to be a much easier way to do things. And then I can do the same thing on the side. You know, I can find the transition, which is kind of a little bit dark at the top right, and transitioning down uh, to the bottom left. And it's all fairly light, um, even though this is the dark side of the building. It'll still read as the dark side of the building in the end, um, because the concrete colors are going to be dark, and that's kind of what defines the dark and light side, not so much what's reflecting off the windows. And, you know, a reflective building like this really does pick up a lot of the ambient light because it's literally reflect reflecting like a mirror. Um, and But you'll find these colors even in buildings if it were all flat and non-reflective. You'll find the, the sky blue color in the shadow. And that's sort of the challenge of this is like whatever time of day, whatever color the sky is, whether it's a gray sky, a blue sky, whether it's like uh, violet, whether it's like red oranges and yellows and sunset, that is that color is going to wind up uh, in the shadows where whatever of whatever it is that you're painting. And so that's what we're looking to do with this exercise. However else the rest of the painting turns out is, you know, is less relevant than you're learning that new concept for the week. Um, now, of course, this also stacks on top of other concepts that we've been working with objects and other things as well. Um, so don't forget what you've done. Don't lose all the concepts that we've worked towards so far, because this kind of incorporates a great many of them. And I think taking care in this transition early on is going to make it easier once we overlay the grid. Um, and the neat thing about this is you can be very loose with this painting style, uh, even though you're painting architecture, as long as you're following these kind of concepts, 
because the concepts will make everything uh, happen and make everything work. Yeah. And I kind of skip side to side. I like to skip around in painting, so I'm kind of developing the whole painting all at once. Um, you know, if I were to spend many, many hours in this, I'd probably do uh, through like three to five layers um, over the whole thing, really getting it refined. But this is a 40 minute study um, and not a intense rendering. I think there's um, different styles and different things that you learn at different lengths of time. And um, with a short length of time like this, you know, we're chasing this one concept that we want to get across. I think the other thing too is um, be comfortable with brush marks. You know, you want at first to, to kind of use softer edges with, um, with your brush marks. You don't want like a ridge of paint usually at the edge of uh, an area that you're just painted because that you have to fight that ridge and that ridge makes it very difficult to control an edge. So sometimes if you blend out the edge just a little bit, it's helpful. Um, brush stroke direction, it, it matters. You can use it uh, arbitrarily and go any direction as long as you're following the rest of the techniques, it'll still work out. But I like to use it in very intentional ways. So on this grid, I'm gonna go use brush marks that go either vertical or, uh, or um, at the diagonal that the plane of the building goes. That way I'm just reinforcing the drawing concept of, um, of the way that this plane is working in, in terms of perspective. You know, the perspective here isn't too difficult because it's literally like you're just drawing a box like you were, like you were draw, doing a regular object drawing or object painting. You know, there's nothing super challenging about the angles here. And because it's above the horizon so much, we don't have like, you know, we don't have to do a lot of three point perspective. Um, we're in two point perspective kind of, um, but largely it's about the shape that we're creating. And because we're focusing on shape here, um, that's going to take some of the pressure off because we don't have to perform in terms of like doing really great perspective stuff. It's also an uncomplicated image because it's not like we're not looking down a street scene and we don't have tons and tons and tons of objects and things to all keep in perspective and in proportion. Um, this is just sort of one building dominating our uh, picture plane. So I think a lot of um, what you choose to do for the project is going to depend on your ambition level um, and confidence level. I think picking something simple to learn the concept is always good. And if you want to pick for a second or third one, pick something more complex. I think that's good too. Um, but, you know, to keep it at the beginning, I think it's good to keep it simple. You don't want to get overwhelmed. <clears throat> One of the things you look for too, when you mix up any given color, is you look for other places in the image where you could use that color. Um, you know, practical reason is that it's, you know, it's wet and acrylic dries really fast. Um, if it were oil, it wouldn't matter. You could leave it all day <coughs> on the palette. The other thing too is using similar colors around the canvas brings a certain unity because you're using all of your colors all over the the canvas or the paper. And that ultimate goal of creating a unified image gets achieved pretty quickly that way. So here I'm laying out this dark shape on the building and there's gonna be other darks that we're gonna use in the bottom. And we might wind up having to remix some of those. What I think is interesting about this is if you get that architectural shape right, um, it really quickly, even though the paint the the painting's not even established, it's already looking like a building, and we can tell kind of where it could go from here. You know, it just goes back to the concept that if you get the shapes right anything that you do within them is going to work. 
So I thought it was kind of important to establish this bottom layer um, so it's not just a floating building. Green with only yellow ochre is a little bit difficult to mix um, to get these like the vibrant sort of greens. But fortunately, um, in our particular image, we don't have very vibrant greens. Uh, we have some yellow greens that'll be easy to mix. Um, but these dark, vibrant greens in the shadows here are going to turn out really nicely um, with the limited palette that we're using. Um, if you want to begin now to expand your palette and begin to use other colors, um, what I what I think about is use a, a bright color wheel version of each color and a earth darker, muddier color of each of the primary colors. And that to me is a good full palette. Um, so you might you might use yellow ochre combined with uh, cadmium yellow uh, or areolide yellow, a very bright yellow. You might combine cadmium red light that we've got with um, a uh, rust red and oxide red. And there's different names for various rusty oxide reds. For blues, m my favorite combination uh, for a long time has been ultramarine blue and cerulean blue um, because they mix together to create a really intense blue. And it's really great for skies and for landscapes. And they also mix well together with... Uh, brighter yellows to create the vibrant greens that you need in landscapes. Um, if, you know, black can be problematic. We're getting it to work here pretty well because we're mixing it. But you can also fake a black with ultramarine blue and burnt umber. And that gives you more flexibility in terms of the blacks that you can make. If you're painting a very pale painting and you need subtleties in the whites, you can also add zinc white to your palette and zinc is a soft mixing white and doesn't change any given color very much. So if you need subtlety, you can expand out into those colors. Um, just a quick note. So now we're finishing up this area and what I've tried to do is, is let a lot of the um, underpainting come through here um, and just focus on those shapes that are kind of laid out. but. I'm not just painting those triangle shapes as a triangle. I'm going along those triangle shapes that I laid out with the, the underdrawing, but leaving little blank spaces and bits where I can see through the, the uh, leaves and stuff. Uh, in a little bit, we're going to actually get some lighting on there and make that happen. Then the ground here is mostly cool colors and kind of kind of streaky. Um, in the photo reference so I think that it'll be fine just to kind of let a lot of um, let a lot of the underpainting through on the ground here at least while we're getting this established you know as soon as we get this this plane established too like what you'll notice is now that th this building is grounded and now we have overlap so now we have our, our foreground middle ground and background and so things are working better right because we have this dark foreground we have we're going to have a light middle ground and a medium background. So we've laid out according to um, one, of our, one of our six combinations in laying out foreground, middle ground, background. And here I wanted to go ahead and quickly establish um, some lighting in the foreground. So a little bit of white, uh, maybe a tiny bit of blue and, um, and some yellow ochre, maybe even some black in there. Uh, that's just left over on the brush is going to create enough of a light value to kind of get the light on the grass and then get the light on the trees. And um, what I'm thinking about doing is just doing, hey, this is like, I can do two-sided trees really quickly. So I can do a light side and a dark side of the trees. And that's going to just like establish my patterns of lighting really quickly and um, make my foreground come forward a little more because I've now got a lighting situation and I've got a lot of contrast. So I think that's really important. Um, contrast pulls things forward. We don't want to bring too much attention to the foreground. Um, so we're not doing hyper detailed trees here. The focus here is going to be on this building. So we want the trees to kind of be there, sit in the foreground, but not draw much attention. That's the kind of goal. I kind of noticed that I, I don't like that initial shape that I put down. 
Uh, so I'm going to like swing the angle down a little bit, um, keep it at that, keep the point at the V notch and then just like go over the building a little bit. Yeah. It's a, it's tricky to match that sky color, but all it has to do is get close. And then by the time that we lay out the uh, actual bright concrete color on the building, um, that difference is going to matter a lot less because we'll have enough contrast to really define the shape of the building. So I think doing a little, having little checkpoints where you like notice these things is really important. You know, once you've established the foreground, middle ground, background, go back and reevaluate. Just say, do, do my shapes work? Does my perspective work? Um, are these, are the value ranges correct? Do I need to make any adjustments to the initial transitions? Um, do I need to, are there any like blank white spots uh, where the canvas primer is showing through? Do I just need to fill the canvas better? What do I need to do to immediately make this better before moving on? You know, because you don't want to keep moving on and moving on and moving on without reevaluating because you'll wind up um, in problem situations that it's going to take a lot of work to get out of. Um, so now what I've done is I've mixed an orange with just like the tiniest bit of cadmium red in there and then um, added some white to it. And then there's a little bit of blue um, to knock it down in its um, in its saturation. This is going to be way more saturated than the photo anyway um, because it's a painting, right? And we want color in the painting. So here what, what we need to do is just paint this grid really carefully. Um, we still have the opportunity to go back within the grid to make adjustments and corrections, but I don't want to like accidentally draw a weird diagonal across this. I want this to look like pretty decent on the first go around. And then what I do want to remind myself of is the grid also can have a value transition and a color transition to it, just like we transitioned uh, on the reflections in the windows before we painted this grid. So, uh, I think taking the time to quickly mix up a slightly darker version, even if it's very subtle, is important just so that you're creating that transition and going through the mental exercise of creating that transition. So you see here, this value that I mixed up just now has a little bit of black in it, not a lot, and it's just going to create the most subtle of effects. Um, but I think it's worth pursuing those subtleties. If we were to spend um, like a month on this painting, you know, we would have like really subtle gradients going on. We would make sure that, you know, every window on this front area had just slight variations in uh, hue and saturation and that we'd had, have tons of these small shapes and everything. But since this is kind of, uh, you know, a one session painting, um, we're going for the, the Cliff Notes version of that. And here's two, here's another set, uh, situation too, where you may need to switch brushes um, and get to a smaller brush. I think as you progress through painting, once you work on those big shapes and medium shapes, you definitely have to get a smaller brush out. So here I've got a, a brush that's about an inch that I began with. The the medium sized shapes of the building and the trees that's laid out with um, about like a half inch, maybe a three eighths inch brush. This is a quarter inch brush and I'm mostly using the side, um, the thin side. Even this is probably too big for what I'm doing, but I tend to like working with brushes that are slightly too big because I have this tendency to make shapes too small um, too early on. So I use bigger brushes to kind of fight that tendency because I'm trying, like, as I teach you how to do this, I'm still learning and I'm trying to get better too. And so knowing my own tendencies, I choose tools that are, um, are, are things that help me train and improve. So what you notice now is now the building really has a light side and a dark side to it. Um, it's pretty clear now that we've established our 
light side, dark side. And I think that's really important to do. Um, the next sort of thing is the left side of the building ha has like a, a less saturated concrete mixture to it. It's weird. It doesn't have the, the same, it's like it wasn't even manufactured by the same company. So I mixed up a separate light that had more black in it that, um, just to use for that little ref that little reflection there of a bright light coming off of the second side of the building. And then I used that um, same sort of mixture, except without as much white to create this dark side of the concrete here on this side of the building. So now that we get this dark concrete in there, it's really going to begin to make things um, come together. Okay. So you see how this color, it has more, has more gray in it. Um, it's still got yellow ochre in the, in the mixture. It's got some blue, but it's not, it's not super light. And what's neat about this is we can use the same color on this dark side everywhere. We don't have to mix a different color really at all because we've done the transitioning within the plane of the left side. And as we run lines across it, they'll look different because of what's behind it. And so that's a really efficient technique is to sort of fake the idea that each one of these lines that goes across has a different color to it. Um, the other thing too is I want to spend some time in the darks here and in the photo you know you can you can kind of see some of that information but when you're standing out there in person you can really see a lot into the darks because your eyes uh, aren't like a camera. You do see information in, in dark shadows. You aren't just look exposing for lights, midtones or dark tones. And so you can really see what's going on everywhere out in the world with your eyes. And um, this is so this is kind of where photo reference breaks down and where you can sort of improve on photos is by working in uh, lights and shadows. We still want to remember to create a simple side and a complicated side of the building. So um, because the reflections and the value transition is more complicated on the fa facing side, that's going to be our complicated side. This left side is going to be our simple side. Now I'm switching down to a very small round brush. Um, it's like maybe an eighth inch, if that, probably more like, um, like a sixteenth of an inch even, um, just to get these really tiny lines. And because I wanted them to be precise, you know, architectural details can get pretty precise. Um, and I think it's it's feasible to include these lines. It's not really feasible to include um, each individual window line and like the little um, bit of metal that, that holds the glass together. Um, so we, we're going to eliminate a lot of those verticals. I trust that the initial brush strokes that I made for the transition on this is going to indicate that enough uh, because they are vertical and they do cross. So we don't have to go through and get a one bristle brush out to get that much detail in. It's just not necessary. Um, but we want this distinctive details and there's this little jig jog where the, the, the center part of the concrete is like a little bit taller and then the edges are, are kind of like narrow and short. So we want to get those details in. And so that's what I'm working on right now, even though you can't see it because my hand's in the way. Um, and here's where you slow down. You know, we're in the late stages, believe it or not. Um, we're at about the 30 minute mark and now we have to start thinking about like, what do I need to do to finish this off and bring it all together, um, in a relatively short amount of time so that it, it achieves the goal that I, that I was after in the first place. 
um, and achieve the vision that I want for this painting, which is like, you know, a balance between loose areas and, and tightly observed areas and getting the bright feel of the day out there. And, um, you know, I think Craig Mullins said this, I think at some point, which was like, um, you know, think more, paint less. So now's the stage where you need to think and analyze and really think about what you want to do with this painting. So here I had noticed that there were some really, really dark areas reflecting back and forth in this area. Um, in this little v-shape so that's what I, what I wanted to attack next was getting a real dark not pure black but adding some blue in there because we still want that ambient color of the blue in and um, really going for these detailed dark shapes here um, working with a narrow contrast range but including a lot of information all the same And as a transition from the simple side on the left to the complex side on the right, um, I feel like more information in the darks um, was kind of necessary because you need simple areas, complex areas, and then this is kind of the, right in the middle where it's, it's not super complex, it's not super simple either. It's also relatively low contrast, and I find it fun to work in, in a lot of detail into relatively low contrast areas. Um, now, to sort of take it home, I wanted to go in and get a little bit of the texture of these windows. Without painting each individual window, what you can do is, because the glass isn't perfectly formed or perfectly set, there's slight curves, you'll see a lot of variation in the reflections on this um, particular reference. So now I think it's a matter of just playing with um, extra values and extra colors of these blues and then um, adding some darks in towards the end to really bring this home and what i wanted to do here is is push it as far as i could um, in the value range without breaking the overall read of this side of the building it is the light side so i have a lot of room to work with and there are dark reflections on it so that gives me a huge amount of contrast here. So this side obviously is going to be the focal point of, of the painting because it has the most contrast. And so what we're going to do is just kind of run with it. And here I think it's good to paint opaquely in some areas and semi-transparently in other areas so that you get a lot of that underpainting kind of coming through so that you're still building that unity. Um, and at this stage, it would be hard to break apart the unity of the painting um, because the shapes are, are fairly well established. Sometimes you wind up painting a color that's incredibly close to what you've already established in the background. So you need to take some time to remix it and uh, get some more paint out and, and figure it out. Um, you also notice that it's probably not the most accurate representation of this building. Like there's probably more, more like levels or subdivisions than the building actually has. Um, but that's okay. You know, um, it doesn't, you know, we're going to remove the, uh, reference. No one's ever going to see it again. And you're going to be left with this, with this painting. So you, you're using, even if you go out and sit there and paint a real building that's right in front of you, you're still using that as a reference and you can make changes to it or get the essence of the building rather than paint the exact rendering of the building. And so here, what I really try to look for is, you know, the same values are going to appear in different areas because the windows do tilt. So even at the bottom, you're going to get some very light areas. Um, 
And so what you're looking for are opportunities to, to use the same color in a bunch of different places. And sometimes, even in the top, you need to bring some high contrast up to the top areas and bring some dark values up to the top areas. And that's what I'm kind of pushing now. So it's kind of like really pushing the envelope of how far I can take this super saturated blue color. Um, it's never the direct ultramarine, but this is getting pretty close. You know, if you need saturated color, most likely it's going to wind up in like three or four small areas where you use color straight out of the tube. Um, other, other, otherwise, you're going to be mixing the colors to various degrees. You, know, you don't ever want to use straight out of the tube color in large areas. Unless you're intentionally wanting to break that rule for some reason. So here at the bottom, I wanted to find some kind of lighter areas. Um, and some middle blue areas before I come back with a super, super dark. And so now what I'm looking for is um, how do I figure out all the unity? You know, how do I get this to pull together? Um, and how do I make it, how do I make an interesting painting towards the end? These are questions you should always be kind of thinking about because you'll have a different way of approaching it. And that'll contribute to you creating um, and mastering different styles of painting. Um, so here, I really wanted to push the envelope of value contrast here and get a really dark, dark um, mixed up. And primarily this is with the Mars black and ultramarine blue. And I'm just really pushing the value range here about as far as it'll go. The other thing too is this dark is gonna make the concrete areas on that grid that we painted very, very um, prominent. It'll draw a lot of attention, especially where you put the dark right next to that light. And then there's certain areas where you want to pick up on small details, you know, little bits of windows that show through and little little ones that don't show through um so it's pretty well established and looking at it now i think you'll see kind of what's missing is the bottom you know it doesn't have enough darks in the bottom um so what i thought would be a quick way to to finish this off is just mix up a, a sort of dark green and go in and add like a, just another really dark dark area because you'll see in the reference photo that there are like extreme darks in the reference and um, I think that that level of darkness will improve this uh, dramatically um, as we work more with color and we want more color the value range inevitably comes towards the middle because you can't have color when you use pure black and pure white. And if your interest is color, you're going to be painting sort of in the middle of the value range a lot. Um, so that being said, sometimes in your late stage reevaluations, you have to come back and you have to re um, redo your contrast level to make sure that you really are doing a dark foreground, a light middle ground and a medium background because now it kind of became like a medium value foreground and so it's uh it's important to come back and reestablish that you know as we wind this down this is going to be like the last bit of the painting um you know there's tons of things that we could do if we were to, to take this into like the three hour painting range or even the hour and a half painting range um but what we're going for is learning about ambient light and stacking that in with all the other concepts that we've learned in the course so far, especially um, 
transitions and value contrast and and your layout of foreground middle ground background and dark medium and light so if you're able to achieve that in 30 40 minutes i think that's great if it takes an hour that's fine too if it takes three hours just to achieve that that's okay as well so take all the time you need and give this a shot you know none of this means anything until you try it yourself um, don't just be an observer and get in there get your hands dirty and um and get uh, get some paint out and get going it's the only way you're going to really learn it and um you know it's going to be rewarding because you're going to you're going to try and you're going to succeed sometimes and you're going to mess up sometimes but in the end you're going to get it so um have fun and i hope you enjoyed this video